Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, just to get a little bit feeling of the lay of the land here, uh, who of you is uh, developing Java applications with Maven? So that's the, that's the majority, right? I guess that that's 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 most of the backend team is in that situation, right? And then we have the we have the, the Android team who is Gradle user. And then I heard there's some data Scala stuff going on, right? But, but, but okay, cool. But that, that's that's uh, uh, that's what I expected. So it's, uh, thanks for the confirmation. Um, okay, so um, <clears throat> we. You know, when I started with Gradle, initially we had, uh, uh, with the Gradle build tool, right, we had uh, initially consulting business. So we were in the trenches, right, with, you know, the big East Coast banks, the, the Silicon Valley uh, 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 companies and, and, and everything else in between. So, so what I basically uh, uh, can, say, can, can say, right, that, that the tool chain effectiveness is so strongly related to developer productivity. And, and what I also can say is that, Tool chain effectiveness, I would say, across the industry ranges from mediocre to bad to terrible, right? I have not seen excellent, outstanding, right? Maybe there are a few rare exceptions, right? But, but that's, it basically doesn't exist, right? And, uh, 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 and, and for a long time, and that is still the case for most companies today, developer productivity is not a discipline that they are practicing, right? There is no group dedicated to that practice and to, to apply engineering uh, uh, mindset to developer productivity, right? And that's a big, that's a big reason for that, right? And, there, and I think there's also not enough sensitivity to the opportunity that you have when you apply certain practices to improve developer productivity. So I want to talk about that. So obviously, but not the only problem, many problems, only many things we can improve, but obviously speed is a very important one, right? But it's also, it's, it's interesting because uh, the thing that, that, that really uh, took me by surprise is some teams are very performance sensitive. So people with a monorepo, right? Or people with a complex platform like Android, right? Every, every developer is complaining there about build speed, right? So, so it's clear that this is top of mind when it comes to uh, where should we invest our, our time when it comes to developer productivity. But then we talk with many organizations and say, performance is not a problem for us. Right? And that's an interesting statement, right? If you think about it, what does it mean it is not a problem, right? Who here thinks performance is not a problem for them? <laughs> and now I'll put you on the spot. So no one. Okay, so who here has build and test times uh, longer than 10 minutes when I run a build? Okay, who is between five and 10 minutes? Who is below five minutes? Okay, more than one minute? Yeah, okay. So what, what I very often see that people with five, six minute build time or seven minutes build time, average build time, I say, performance not a problem. And then uh, uh, I, try, I say, well, but what if we can get it down to four? And then they say, well, it's not a problem. And, I, and then I, I dig deeper. It's not a problem because no one is complaining about it. So developer productivity at those organizations is completely reactive. If no one is complaining, everything is fine, right? But that's, that's not a very mature state. Right, uh, uh, it's like you have a website, like I don't know, <laughs> uh, the, the Spotify website, right? And and you have data that you know when when a certain web page doesn't load fast enough, you will have 10% fewer signups, right? Customers will not, or the prospect will not complain about it, but you don't care whether they complain or not. You know it has those effects, and the same is true for developer productivity. So, so I want to start with uh, some real-world examples, right? Anonymized, but but uh, company you. you I'm sure you all here use the technology from, right? They have, they, we, we, we measured various teams. So team one ha has 11 developers, team two, six developers. Team one has a build time of four minutes. Team two has a build time of one minute. Number of local builds of team one, 850, of team two, 1,010. So what, what jumps into your eye? Team two is asking twice as often per developer for feedback than team one. Right, so four minutes seems to be a tax for those guys, saying, oh, four minutes is, uh, I ask a little bit less often for feedback, right? And I make my increments, my change increments a little bit bigger. That's what we see continuously, right? And, but most people would say four minutes is fine, it's not, it's not, not worth investing in, right? Or one minute, who, who, who would even think about investing into making a one minute build faster, right? Okay, so let's look at the next slide. So, there's quite a bit of research, Google did a lot of internal research that comes to the conclusion, everything that is faster than 10 minutes 
the likelihood that the developer is just wait for this feedback cycle to finish without doing anything else is high, right? And the more, the closer it gets to, to, to zero seconds, the more this likelihood increases. So when you have a one minute feedback cycle, you wait, you don't do anything else, right? Or you do something else, you read the newspaper, then, then it takes five minutes <laughs> until you get back, right? So, so now look at this team with six developers, right? Uh, they have 1,010 let's, local builds per week. We improved with, with, just with, in a couple of weeks, they built them from one, one minute to 0.6 minutes. That saves that six developer team 44 days per year, right? It doesn't sound super sexy, one minute to 0.6 minutes, but it's a very significant, I mean, it's 44 developer days for a team of six, right? And that's, I think, what is missing, right, in those discussions, right, that people just go by gut feel. Oh, it's, it's a problem, it's not a problem. You need data to decide not whether it's a problem, but whether it's worthwhile investing into making it faster and what is the return of investment, right? For larger teams, right, let's say 100 developers, 12,000 12, builds per week, right, nine minute build time. If you get that build time down to five minutes, savings per year is 5,200 days. That's 25% of your whole R&D budget, basically, right? So uh, people should care about that, right? And some organizations care a lot and some not so much, but it's a maturity process we're having right now in the industry, right? So what I, in general, recommend as a solution to that problem is, uh, uh, you know, because things less than 10 minutes cause significant waiting time, just make everything slower, that it takes longer than 10 minutes, right? No? Not? You don't think it's a good idea? Uh, yeah, so when the build and test time <laughs> takes longer than 10 minutes, right, then people do context switching, right? And uh, uh, let's say when, you, when you're on a happy path, right, you, you uh, 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 push your changes, pull request, build is triggering, right? Even if it takes an hour and everything is successful and gets auto-merged, fine, right? Then usually it, it, long build time is not so much of a problem. But in average, 20% of all builds fail, right? Uh, because for, for many reasons, right? So, so whenever the build fails, right, and you switch to something new, now you have to switch back, right? And that is a high cost, right, this context switching. And the longer the build takes, the more things you have running in parallel, right? Uh, and that, that is a mental burden that, that, is, that, that, that really seriously affects productivity, right? And... Uh, and of course, an unreliable tool chain with flaky tests substantially increases this cost, right? So let's say if 20% of your builds are failing because of flaky tests, right? Uh, then, then this happens much more often that you, 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 you context switch, you have to debug, you have to understand why did the build fail, and then you see, oh, it's a flaky test, oh, I have to run it again, right? So, and we have quite a few organizations where it takes... Uh, so, so who here is... Uh, uh, often not that happy how long it takes to get a pull request into a mergeable state because of flakiness issues. Now, at our company, it's a big problem, right? People really complain, right? So, okay. Um, and, and one thing that we're seeing, right, the longer the build, the, the harder it is to debug a problem. Why? What happens when the build time is longer, right? People put more stuff in their change set, right? Because they know, oh, it's so hard to get a pull request through. I don't want to do it for a small change, right? Let's, 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 let's try the lottery, right? And let's make a bigger change, right? But when it then fails, it's, it's harder to understand why it fails, right? So, uh, and in general, the fixed time grows exponentially over detection time, right? There's, there's, there's quite a bit of, of, of studies around that, right? So, uh, um, so, so that's why it's important, even, even if you're not in a situation where people are complaining about build time, that should not be, for, for a company like Spotify, any criteria. The, crit the criteria should be how much would we make our people more productive if we improve it by X, right? That should be the only question that counts, right? So, and a big part of uh, uh, making things faster, right, is, uh, uh, is the concept of build caching. I know that the, the Android team is using that. In Maven, uh, it's not a concept that, that basically is built into Maven, right? But there are options to, to, to introduce build caching into Maven. So who of you has, has, has heard about build caching? Right. So uh, 
Um, yeah, some build systems like Gradle, uh, uh, Bazel, Buck, they, they offer that. In the C++ world, there are some offerings around that. Maven doesn't have anything like that. But, uh, um, but it's extremely important, right, to, to make your builds faster. So let's look at a small build, right? So, so who of you has Maven builds with only one module? Right, so it's the minority, right? Because you will benefit not so much from build caching. So, uh, uh, okay, so the concept of build caching is pretty simple, right? Uh, uh, every Gradle task, every Maven goal, right, that you execute has inputs, right? Compile goal has the inputs, uh, 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 the source code, the compile class path, the Java version, right? And it has outputs. And the idea uh, which for the compile goal would be uh, uh, the, the compiled classes, right, obviously. And the idea of build cache is when the inputs have not changed, reuse the outputs from a previous run, right? And that cache usually lives at two layers. One is on your local machine, uh, um, which is very helpful when you, when you, when you uh, work with uncommitted changes. But then there's also a remote cache that is fed by all the CI builds, right? And then, and then uh, the output can be shared across all other CI builds and all developer builds. Um, so the idea is pretty simple, right? So, so uh, uh, for every goal, right, for the inputs of every goal, we calculate a hash, right? A hash, for example, for the compile goal, it would be a hash function, source file, JDK version, class path, compiler argument, and then we, then, then, then we calculate a cache key, right, out of that hash that uniquely represents the input of that task, right? And, and then the cache is a simple key value store, right? Uh, um, and, and when you run a goal, you can ask, before you execute it, right, you, you can ask the build cache, do you have output for that input, right? So, um, and uh, very important, this is a generic concept. Initially, people think, oh, it's for compilation only, right? No, it's for everything, right? Java doc, check style, unit test, right? They all have inputs and outputs, right? The outputs of the test are the test results, right? So, uh, so it's a huge build avoidance opportunity if you do build caching, right? So, so uh, yeah, all the Maven users, I guess, when you run Maven, you always run a clean build, I suppose, right? Otherwise, uh, uh, things get very unreliable because Maven is not an incremental build system. So that means whatever you change in your code, right, or whatever, you know, whatever CI is built, whatever change CI is building, you always, for this project, you would build those 25 goals, right? Generate some sources, compile, check style, compile a test, run the tests, right? So with a build cache, let's say I only change something in the export API module and no other module, let's say, depends on export API, right? In this case, I, um, um, let's say, before, when I execute core compile, right, uh, uh, I hook in uh, into the Maven life, we hook into the Maven life cycle, right, and then we calculate the cache key for the compile goal of core. We ask the build cache, do you have an entry? The build cache, yes, was run before. Here's the output. I don't need to run uh, uh, core compile. But export API, I've changed the sources, so I have now a hash key where the build cache will say, no, I have no output for this. Okay, then we have to run the compile goal. And we have to run check style because the sources were changed. We have to compile the tests, depending on what type, but let's not get into details uh, of that. And we have to run the test, right? And of course, if I have a situation like, let's say, security, a uh, web app depends on security, and I change uh, 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 security. I need, to, I need to compile security, I need to check style security, I need to run a test for security, but we have some smartness in here. When the security change in compile is an implementation change, I just change, let's say, the implementation of a method, right? I don't need to recompile the test, and I don't need to recompile web app, because uh, for compilation, only if I change the public API uh, uh, of the security code, I would need to recompile, but I need to rerun the test, right? But even in that scenario, I only need to run four out of 25 goals and only two uh, test suites out of five. It's, it's a huge difference, right? And um, so when you look at some Maven projects, right? For example, it's free Spring Boot project. They just migrated to Gradle two weeks ago. So this is from the time when they were still using Maven. Uh, a couple of months ago, running, and they have 300,000 lines of code, 100 submodules, right? Uh, uh, 
running and compiling, uh, uh, compiling the code and running the unit test takes 20 minutes. Fully cached, it gets down to two minutes. And that is, it's a complete game changer for such a project, right? Uh, uh, because now people no longer say, oh, I don't want to run the test. Oh, I don't want to run the test locally. I want to run them only on CI, right? Uh, uh, so, and when you look at, at bigger projects, right, uh, um, what you see, what we see in general, very often that 50% of the modules are leaf modules. No other modules depend on them. So when you change a leaf module with the build cache, your build time will go down one divided by number of modules, roughly, right? Uh, but uh, I, only want, I also want to show another example, right? Let's, let's show something live. So this is, uh, everyone here knows, I guess, SLF4J, simple logging for state for Java, right? Uh, this is a project, if we look at this, right, very small project. It has uh, uh, 12, 11,700 lines of code. So let's, let's build this project. Uh, and I disable any caching, right? So that, is, that would be your normal experience, right? And the Maven build is running and, uh, yeah, looks pretty snappy, right? Uh, build is done in, should be something like 30 seconds. It's great, but hey, kind of a conversation, right? So 30 seconds, is, it feels pretty long when you're on stage and you wait for it to finish, <laughs> right? Uh, so 27 seconds, right? Uh, now let's run it with the caching enabled. And it should be much faster. And this is now done in eight and a half seconds, right? So once you're at eight and a half seconds, you don't want to go back to 30 seconds. Although I, I guess most people here with 30 second or one minute build do not complain about the build time, but you see what is possible, right? So, and then it's all a question of simple math. How often do you run the build, et cetera? So, Another, another big aspect of the build cache is how much load it reduces on CI. So do you have any issues with queuing time on CI? Or you have enough machines? <laughs> no one dares to say something? Is that, yeah. <laughs> so there is a queuing issue, right? Uh, so this is a company, 150 engineers, right? They, they were measuring how many of their builds uh, uh, on CI that were that basically, that, that uh, had to wait in a queue to be built, right? And they were at kind of 40, 50%, right? Before they introduced build caching, right? After they introduced build caching and optimized the build cache, right? They had the first time ever on August 18th, right? They had not a single build that wasn't, that, that had, to, had to wait in a queue, right? And you save a lot of money for CI resources, right? Even though, you know, it will not, <laughs> you don't pay for it, I guess, right? But uh, uh, it, it, there's a huge economic benefit just, just from that aspect. Um, so, one interesting part of that, we talked about single module projects, right? Uh, uh, build caching uh, gives, you, gives you huge performance benefits when, when, you, when you modularize better, right? So, so, so when, let's say, some architects say, oh, we should modularize this better, it's good for the modularity, for the man maintainability of our application, right? Now they can also say, well, if you modularize better, we have a higher cache effectiveness, right? And our general build and feedback uh, test time will go down, right? So that's a, that's a nice correlation, right? Modularization and, and, and build uh, and test speed. Another thing we're working on is distributed test execution for local and remote builds, but I don't want to go into that uh, today. So, so one important part, right, of developer productivity engineering is acceleration technology, like build caching and like distributed test execution. Another thing I think that would be really cool to have is smart incremental testing at one point, but okay, so that's, that's one part. Technology where you plug in your build and immediately things get faster, right? or with a little bit of configuration, they get faster. Okay, that's one part of the story. The other part of the story is uh, it's so important to collect data to keep builds and test fast, right? So my first uh, question that I, that I like to ask, right? Let's say, I don't know who's responsible here for builds. Let's say someone is doing a developer productivity initiative, right, for the Java backend team, right? And let's say your code base will grow this year by 30%. It's probably more than that. Uh, uh, and let's say someone makes the average build time 10% faster. Would anyone notice that? 
right? Would anyone praise that person for having done that? They probably have saved, I don't know how many engineers you have in backend, 500. They probably, there's probably savings in R&D in engineering days of, I don't know, maybe millions of dollars or uh, uh, tens or 20 or 30 of, of additional engineers, and yet it would be under the radar, right? So, so that's, that's, that, that's the thing that should make people think, hey, uh, uh, do we want to be in that situation, right? Someone is having a massive impact, and we don't even realize that it was a massive impact, right? Uh, that's, that's happened when, when developer productivity is mostly done by surveys and by gut feeling, what the people think needs to be improved. It is an important source of input, but data is also very, very important. I mean, I don't have to tell you, I think. So, so, that's, so that's one thing. So people, people uh, uh, often don't, don't notice small regressions. So, and, and they come from everywhere, those small regressions, right? People say, oh, let's add this annotation processor, right? Oh, compile time is not 20% slower, but no one really you know, notices that with the whole fluctuation that is out there, right? So you make choices and, and you don't have any data that, that, that tells you, hey, there's a tr trade-off when it comes to feedback cycle time or reliability, right? So, uh, so for you, this feedback cycle time reliability is, is something that is not related to your choices mentally, although it is related, right? So the other thing is uh, who reports weird and flaky regression? So let's say you have three times a week some weird behavior of your building test, right? Something is very slow, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, who, who reports that? To whom? So, um, what the, the situation is, right? Let's say I would report that. I sit in the Gothenburg office or in New York, right? I know the build people are here, and I now would say, hey, I have this weird issue. It happens a few times a week. Well, on, on my local machine. Then, yeah, so how do you help that person, right? Yeah, let's try to reproduce it. Well, it's very flaky. Good luck. Oh, I cannot reproduce it on my, my machine. So sorry, right? So, uh, so people know when they report word issues, it's, it, it requires a lot of their time then to investigate what is go going on. And then often you still don't know what is going on and then you continue and you live with that weird issue, right? So uh, that's why people basically accept a low quality tool chain. That's what we see build sucks. Build sucks. It's just, it's just part of developer's life. Right, uh, I don't think that that, that that is the attitude that we that we see. Right, uh, uh, and people live with it. Then they say, okay, then let's run the build again. Fine. Right. So, and uh, uh, and a big problem is right. Uh, uh, it's very hard, very often, to determine the root cause of a regression. Right, because you don't have comprehensive data to do that. Right. Uh, so, for me, a typical example of that is you have a you have a failed build on CI and let's say your pull request build, and the initial reaction is, when it's not completely obvious what the reason is for that breakage, I run it again, right? Is, is that, would that be a pattern that exists here at, at Spotify, right? And, uh, um, and then you live with that, because it's so hard, it would be so hard for you to figure out what exactly went on, right? And then the other problem is, right, when I'm responsible for developer productivity and someone tells me, hey, I have this problem, right? I have a thousand other things to do. How should I prioritize that? Right? There's now a single person that reports a problem. What I would like to know, who else has this problem, right? How big of a problem is that so that I can make a decision, should I prioritize it or not? Otherwise, you know, prob probably the person who complains the loudest wins and gets my attention, right? Which is also not a very uh, effective pattern, right? So that is why we think, right, it's so important to capture comprehensive data of every build and test run that is happening here at Spotify. Every local build, every CI build, everything you want to have captured, right? Otherwise, the, the world will be full of surprises, right? We, have, we worked uh, with that insurance company. They had um, small Spring Boot microservices, right? And the build time on CI for them was usually 20, 30 seconds, right? And then we started to collecting the data, and then... We, w we were seeing those builds, 20 minute build time for those microservices. And they were like, well, what is going on here, right? And then we did, we did root cause analysis and what we figured out, oh, those are people working from home, dialing in via VPN and using a network share as the build output directory, <laughs> right? And now, and they had no idea that people were, be, were, ex were having that kind of behavior, right? And I can imagine with your fast growth, I, I, I don't, I'm sure there's very interesting stuff going on that let's say the developer productivity people not necessarily aware of, right? Because you don't have the data, 
right? So, um, and, uh, and a very important part, right, for me of uh, a healthy tool chain is effective troubleshooting, right? At the moment, right, when I, uh, um, uh, when I have a problem, right, uh, uh, and I ask for help, it, it, let's say I have, a, I have a failure when I run a local build, I don't understand where it's coming from, and now I, I want to ask David for help, right? Hey, do you know? Where, yeah, send me the send me the the console output. Okay, uh, copy paste, send you the console, and then, hmm, not sure what version of Java Java are you using, right? How much memory do you have assigned, right? Can I see the dependency graph, right? Can I see this? Can I see that, right? So it's a complete ping pong of 20 questions, super inefficient. Everyone is already, oh, why have I asked, right? Kind of. <laughs> so so trouble is so the mean time to repair uh, uh, such a thing is, is way too long, right? Plus, you. David relies on what I think has happened. How much, how much uh, uh, memory do you have assigned to the build? Uh, two gigabytes. Okay, you have to believe that person, right? So, so we had a funny situation, right? We, were, we had a, a, a company, they were trying out our product, they were super excited about uh, the acceleration promise, and then they were running a build with the build cache and without it. And I said, well, with your Cradle Enterprise product, our build time is five times longer. They were super disappointed. And we were like, come on, you know, something must. And are you running the builds exactly the same, right? And they were, yes, absolutely. Those were the build experts there, the build engineers. So, but we said, we said, we cannot believe it. And they were getting annoyed with us that we were questioning what they were saying, right? And then, but fortunately, we, 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 we then could, could, could trigger the data collection. And, and what we saw is, right, we did a comparison when you have all the data of all the builds, you can simply do comparison, right? And then we, we saw, ha, huh, the, the machine without our technology was running with 128 threads, and with our technology, was a different branch, was using only one thread. And they were shocked when they saw that, right? They, they would have, under oath, would have said, no, it's exactly the same, right? And then the situation was, right, they had a, dot, they had a parent directory with a .nvm directory and a Maven config file where they defined uh, that 16 cores should be used to run that build. And then they had my project was their standard branch, my project with build cache was our branch, and to connect the build cache, you have to create a .nvm directory with an extensions XML, and the behavior of Maven is, it looks for the first and .nvm directory in a hierarchy, and then it doesn't look for a second one. Right? You, you see, but they, they didn't, so troubleshooting is so hard when you rely on the interpretation of people what has happened. Right? You want to have data of what has happened, right? And you don't want to rely on that. So that was, a, that was, an, that was an interesting example, right? So, um, okay. So um, I want to show you some stuff. Um, so when I say, right, uh, this, is, this is how we do it at Gradle, right? So, so uh, um, every row here, right, represents a build that is executed. Right, uh, at any local build from all our people all over the world, all our engineers, every CI build, right, the data is captured, right, and, and we call such a, uh, uh, we do that for Gradle builds, we do that for Maven builds, right, and um, so, and now you can do interesting stuff, right, so, so let's say, let's say you have a, a, a CI build, right, where you have a failed test, right, and again, it doesn't matter, it, it's not important to, to be able to read the words here. Uh, you get the idea, there's a failing test with, with, the, with the test report, right, why it failed. So now you can say, hey, I have a failing test, right, and uh, can, I don't know why it failed, can someone help me? So you send that people, that, that link that immediately points to a failing test, and then I can look at it and you can say, yeah, I had that failure, right, I think it was related to a dependency issue. Uh, uh, let me see what version of HTTP client they're using, ah, they're using 4.5.10, right? So I can now send them this link back, hey, you're using, you're using 4.5.10 of HTTP client, right? If you upgrade to 4.6, you, you, that should fix the problem. Or you can, you can look at, at oh, I, I think it might be related to their Java version. Ah, they're running Java 11, right? Or, or I had that problem when I was running Maven builds in parallel, let's see, if, if the build was run in parallel, right? In this case, yes, parallel was on. So, so or you can say, yes, uh, they might be using an old version of the Surefire plugin or whatever the, pro right? You, the key thing is you have now comprehensive data 
to reason about a problem without trying to reproduce it, right? That is at the heart of that, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, and once you have, and for us it's so important, and we say capture data not just of the failed builds, of each and every build, because you might say, I have no idea why this is failing, but what I know is I can now say, hey, let's compare this with a build that was successful, right? And then you can compare builds, and then we, you, you can learn, oh, the dependencies were different in the build, right? Or uh, some custom values were different, right? Or infrastructure was different, right? So th this is fantastic to reduce debugging dimensions, right? When you have no idea why this thing failed, you might say it could be anything, and we tell you, no, dependency graph is exactly the same, everything else is, then, then you, you have already, you know already where not to look, right? So that's the beauty when you have data about each and every build, right? So, um, um, so, okay, so that's, so troubleshooting, very important part, reduce the mean time to repair a problem, uh, to, to reduce the mean time to fix the problem. So now I'm curious about, let's say about the following, let's say the following scenario, someone is changing, the infrastructure team is changing the, the Docker agents for CI, right? And they're releasing it, and that change is causing now five, ten percent of the CI builds to fail. What would be the process here at Spotify to fix that problem? Here is what, what I see with most organizations, right? What the process is. So uh, the developer that is surprised by this, you know, by the CI build failure, is, is the, his or her pull request build, they look at it, and the first thing they say, well, that's weird, I have no idea what's going on. Let's run it again. Okay, run it again. Failure is still there. <sighs> should, I, should I ask, should I file an issue? I run it one more time. Okay, failure is still there. Let's file an issue with the CI team, whoever is responsible. Well, they say, okay, I will look at it later, right? I also don't know exactly what's going on. Then a second developer runs it, does the same dance. The third one, the fourth one. At one point, it's clear something is going on here, right? But after four hours, I don't know how long it would take, right? Uh, uh, so you, you, when you, we see that people are mostly reactive, unless it's full outage, obviously. But when there are certain new problems that are not like full outage problems, right? It, it's completely reactive, and, and people have to run into these problems, right, frequently until they're fixed. Is that, or would you do, deal with this here differently? No, okay, so I guess no one is saying yes, so, uh, yeah. So, and that's kind of, I mean, if you think about it, that's not how the Spotify website works. I'm pretty sure about that, right? You have very, uh, uh, or, you're, or with the, are you using Crashlytics or for the Android app, I don't know. Yeah, so, so of course, I mean, otherwise you would have sleepless nights every night. I mean, imagine, you could, you could not imagine a world, I, can, I, I would think, right, where you don't have that kind of feedback, whether everything is working correctly and what the problems are, right? So, uh, uh, but for your tool chain, you don't have that, right? So, so that's, so what we are doing, right, is that, you know, we, we, we collect all the failures. Yeah, the resolution, it, it kind of makes it a little bit hard, but we collect all the failures of every local, of every CI build, and then the first thing we do is we analyze the failure messages, and then we classify them into verification failures and non-verification failures. So the verification failures are the good, I don't even consider them failures. For me, a build, a build is successful if they have detected a problem with the code, but we call it, we call it still a build failure, right? Uh, uh, but then you have the non-verification failures. Those are problems with the tool chain, some weird, null pointer exceptions, out of memory exceptions, not serializable exception, right? Something that is obviously wrong with the tool chain. And then, and then what we do is we, uh, let's increase the period to the last, so that's last four weeks, let's do a refresh. So, and then we, we, we classify those non-verification failures into uh, uh, similar failures, right? And then, we, and then you see interesting stuff, right? You can, now, you, can now see, you can now look at some of those failures, right? Like this one, right? And you could see, right, it didn't, it hardly ever occurred. And then January 20, right, out of a sudden, we had a spike of that problem. So now our people, can look at this when I can see, oh, th th something is going on here, right? And then it was fixed, right? Without waiting for people to complain, right? And, 
And when you have the data, you can immediately see, okay, this failure only affected CI builds. You cannot read this here. It's our Team City agents, right? And this failure is not just affecting a single host, but 36 different hosts. So you know already, uh, do you do ephemeral CI here at Spotify? You, you always throw the, the CI agent away, or are you reusing the agent? Okay, so, so you could immediately see, oh, it's all on one damn host, so let's throw it away, right? So that's the kind of, uh, you can see what type of build, right? Uh, 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 functional, all, we have all different type of build categories, right? And then, so, so, so you, see, you see that, so you see that it's new, I need to act, but then you also have all the build scans related to that failures to do a root cause analysis, right? To have uh, what exactly is happening here, right? So, and I want to... Uh, uh, I want to sh share one other demo with you uh, uh, that is a little bit, little bit more comprehensive. So we had, um, uh, let's, let's go to this guy, let's do this here. So, so we had a couple of issues with the stability of our release build. So that was for the Gradle build tool, right? So, so we, had, uh, we had a lot of, uh, yeah, too many too many <laughs> failed builds on CI. So we, so then, so we were trying then to, to, to understand what is going on. So we were basically filtering now our builds. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really, so uh, this here says, we say, hey, filter git branch name equals release, right? So only, only the uh, builds from the release branch. And here we say only CI builds uh, uh, and only builds that are tagged with uh, ready for release. So, so really, those are really the builds that that try to build a, a release candidate or a GA of Gradle build tool, right? So, and then we were, were analyzing where, where are the test failures coming from, right? And then, um, and then we see, right, there are two major sources, right? One is the test daemon lifecycle spec, and the other is uh, uh, instant execution Jacoco integration test, right? So, we know already, I, uh, we, you know, someone else was looking at the Jacoco integration test, so, so we wanted to understand what is going on with the daemon lifecycle test, right? So we, yeah, unfortunately, so we can see 14% of, uh, uh, of the builds uh, uh, where this test was executed failed, right? So that is, a big, that is a big number, right? So then we clicked on the test, and now we could see some uh, uh, interesting stuff, right? We could see... Uh, First of all, this is the performance profile of the test. So what you can, what you can see is when, when a failure occurs that had a, had, had a big impact on test execution time, right? Uh, uh, tests took much longer uh, when they were failing. So we see that pattern very often. So, so flaky tests are, are, are a problem when it comes to, to, to test execution time as well. So, okay, so and then we, then we have every test method here and we, we, we saw that uh, 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 the test, a new daemon is started if all existing are busy, is the main culprit. So we looked at, at that particular build, right, and uh, at that particular test method, right, and uh, here you could really see what an impact the failures have, right, when it failed on average test execution time. That's just a side note, right. So now we're getting deeper to the root of the problem. We have, now we can, we can look at, at the failed builds and we can already see from a from the host name, this is, yeah, unfortunately you cannot see that from behind. So those are, all those failed builds, they, they come from, only from two different hosts, right? So the failed builds are only happening on two different hosts. When I look at all outcomes, right, I see I have, I have all our hundreds of hosts, right, in that bucket, but, but the failed builds, right, only happened on two hosts, right? I could now increase the time window, right, and, and then I would say, uh, let's, this is only for one week, let's look at four weeks, I would see the same picture. So now, that already gives me a hint, and I wonder, what the hell is going on with this? What, what is, is there anything special with those hosts? So now, I can click into the build scan, uh, and uh, uh, first of all, I can look at the, at the error message, which says something like, uh, 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 problem with, Cradle daemon registry, whatever that means. And then I can look at infrastructure and can see, oh, this is one of our macOS boxes, right? And we could look at the other builds. It's all macOS hosts, right? And, and this is a real problem, a real bug in Cradle that we had flakiness for, for the daemon on, on, on Mac, right? And we fixed actually, we found actually a Cradle bug with that. But 
you, you see how you can now, when you have the data, comprehensively do this kind of analysis. How would you do this otherwise? I have no idea, right? It's, it's a lot of, yeah, it would definitely take you much, much, much more time, right? And, and the likelihood that you would just live with the problem would be much higher. Yeah, so, <laughs> you can read that. Um, okay, so, um, we, we we've have an early access edition of a book, right, that, that is called Developer Productivity Engineering, where we go into more details on those topics, right? Uh, uh, and and uh, you can download that for free. You go to the website, so uh, uh, we're adding chapter after chapter to it um, and try to make this a really comprehensive piece of work on that topic. Thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Thanks for your time. <laughs>